お待たせいたしましたただいまよりセッション6フィンテック最前線オンラインの有資革命を開始させていただきますモデレーターは We have as a moderator from r a k t e n Fintech Fund Managing Partner, we have Mr. Oscar m i l And as analyst, panelist, s the founder and the CEO of Blue Line, Blue Vine,、uh, Mr. Errol Rifflitz. Rifflitz. And CEO of INSEC,、uh, Mr. James Gutierrez. Gutierrez. And also the manager of capital marketing section of Avant, Mr. Tim Clark. So,、uh, Oscar san, please. Um, we're very excited today to actually start、uh, our session, our second fintech session, on the revolution of online lending, which has been a very interesting trend and a major segment in fintech today. So,、uh, we have、um, some very illustrious guests、um, here today with us,、um, starting to my left. Ial Lifshitz, CEO of Bluevine. We also have uh, James uh, Gutierrez,、um, CEO of, of Insect. And I have to say that I'm actually very proud to, to mention that both、um, CEOs are part of our portfolio group of, of companies within the Rakuten FinTech Fund. And last but not least,、uh, we have Tim Clark from Avant Capital, who's、um, managing their capital markets、um, effort. So,、um, we're going to kick it off by having each one of our guests、um, effectively show a little presentation and, and describing、uh, their business model. So, we're going to kick it off with, with James, if, if you want to go first, please.、Uh, first, Konnichiwa.、Uh, very proud to be here in Tokyo.、Uh, thank you for having us.、Um, as Oscar said,、uh, my name is James Gutierrez. Uh, thank you. I've been,、uh, I've been an entrepreneur for 12 years in the United States, focusing on fintech and lending.、Uh, I, went, I was fortunate to、uh, have studied at business school at Stanford, and I had my first idea to start a company that helped immigrants in the US get access to credit. And that company was called Opportune. And then three years ago, I had the great opportunity to start Insect. So now let me tell you a little bit about Insect. So, at Insect, we offer,、uh, you've heard of software as a service, we offer lending as a service. So, first, in the, in the US, it's surprising to a lot of people, but many people are struggling financially in the United States. 47% of people in the US, if there was an emergency $400 expense, Would not have the savings to cover that expense. So there's a massive need for credit and for affordable credit for middle class people in the United States、uh, and low income people that want to do better but don't have that access. And so we aim at Inseek to solve that problem to help those people. What's happened in the US is that there's all kinds of new regulations that have entered the market since the financial crisis. And so the banks, Can't serve this need. And it's left a very, very large gap. There's been many changes up on this slide. We just have mentioned four.、Uh, we had the Dodd Frank、uh, set of acts, there was a large credit card regulation.、Uh, there's changing in capital requirements for banks called Basel II, Basel III. And all of that has made it very difficult for banks to lend. So it's opened up a very large market.、Uh, all the while, working families, what they really want is. In the US, is the American dream. How do I get ahead? How do my kids go to college? And for us, we work with a lot of people who don't have credit scores. And if, you, if any of you ever spend time in the US as an immigrant, if you don't have a credit history, it's like not having a face. You don't really exist in the financial system because everything runs on this credit score. So, what we want to do is give people that face and help them.、Uh, and so, what we realized. 
is three years ago that brands, not banks, are the lenders of tomorrow. That means that big companies are realizing, you know, the banks are not lending to my customer, so I want to make this loan. So we found that all kinds of brands across the country, from financial companies to banks to retailers, are saying, you know, I have data, I have customer third-party data that's sitting in my database on how people shop, how people use my product, and I want to use that data to be able to make a loan, but I don't want to do anything related to the loan business. I don't want to do the back office, I don't, want to, I don't have the technology, and I don't want to do the credit scoring, so can someone help me? And that's where we raise our hand and say, we built the platform that we call Lendify, and so you think about us as kind of like the Intel chip inside your phone, where powered, these companies use us and we power their lending. So we provide the scoring, the application, the back office, the loan funding, and we do that retail, web, and mobile. But we first started, just to take it back a few years, that, that picture is me in 2005. This was, I know I, I, I probably was more handsome then. <laughs> this is uh, lending done the old way. This is when I started my old company, which is called Opportune now, but it was called Progreso Financiero then. And that's literally a picture of me handing the first loan to the first customer. So that's, that's loans done in the retail environment. And now with Inseek, today you apply for a loan in a store on a tablet. This is our technology today where you can fill out what you're looking for, sign all the documents on a tablet, and this is what it looks like today. So we've made, we've made some advancements since then. So we believe this is the future of lending, and we're, at Inseek, we're looking to power more brands who want to use their data so they can solve this problem and helping working families get access to credit. The other side of our business is, since we're not a bank, the question is, how do we fund all these loans we're making? We've built our own uh, syndication and securitization market that's all online that allows investors with tools to track risk and performance. And so from the loans we make, we create bonds that everyday investors can buy from us and they can get a better yield because also in the US, like I, I know in Japan, we have a very low interest rate environment. So investors are looking for higher yield and we provide them all the tools and transparency to do that. So that's a little bit about us and Inseek. And with that, I think we also have a, just a very brief video to show you so you can see how it works. Thank you. Thanks very much, James. So, ne next one is Yal from Blue Vine, please. Uh, Blue Vine no Yal -san ni I am the co founder and CEO of Blue Vine. I'm very excited to be here today. This is my first time in Japan, um, and um, thank you for having me. Two minutes about my background um, I went through several professions throughout my career. I started as a research scientist, then I uh, became a management consultant, and then before Blue Vine, I worked in venture capital. I started my career while I was a VC at Greylock Partners in Israel and Europe. I saw a lot of companies uh, doing innovative things in the financing space, and I came up with the idea for Blue Vine. At Blue Vine, we are reinventing working capital financing for small businesses. I'll start with a short video, which will give you a good overview of what we do in our product. You're a small business owner. Maybe you're the CEO of a marketing agency, or you're an engineering consultant. You might even tame elephants for a living. But no matter what you do, it often seems like what you end up doing most is waiting. Yes, waiting to get your invoices paid. Waiting and waiting and waiting. These cash flow gaps make it hard to manage expenses, 
Also, if you could get the money now, you could reinvest it in growing your business. Now you can. Introducing BlueVun, a fast and easy way to get an advance on your invoices. Signing up with BlueVine is easy. Enter a few details about yourself and your business and connect your invoicing or accounting software. Your unpaid invoices will automatically appear in your dashboard. Select one or more invoices to advance with a click of a button. You can get cash in as little as 24 hours for your first invoice advance and even sooner for repeat usage. So how does your customer pay BlueVine when the invoice is due? Once you're approved on BlueVine, you'll receive a BlueVine account, a unique bank account number, and a physical P.O. Box address, both in your business name. With the bank account number, you will be able to accept electronic payments, and with your P.O. Box, checks. And since your BlueVine account is in your name, your customers can continue making the payments in your name. Sign up with BlueVine, stop waiting, and free up your cash today. BlueVine, fast funding, Simple and transparent, 100% online. You're a small business owner. Maybe you're the CEO of a marketing agency. Or you're here. Okay. Um, I love this video, especially as he gets uh, a beard while he's waiting to get paid. Uh, pretty simple what we do. We allow small businesses to get advances on their invoices, so they don't have to wait for 30 or 60 days, uh, and instead, can invest in their business growth, cover payroll, uh, buy inventory, et cetera. We did not invent this financial instrument. It's called factoring. It actually dates back to Babylon, 4,000 years ago. It's one of those industries that not a lot of people talk about, uh, particularly not uh, like other markets you see in this slide, but it is a huge market, over 100 billion of invoices are funded each year in the US, uh, over $15 billion in fees, and there are over 1,000 companies doing factoring in the US today. So no shortage of competition. Um, so if there's so many companies already doing it, why did we decide to get into this space? Well, these companies are all offline companies. This is actually a picture of the website of a factoring company when I started looking into the space and I wanted to learn more about factoring and I Googled, this is the first one that came up. And beyond the fact that it looks like a website from 1992, um, uh, what I learned more about this industry is that it is certainly not an online one. While companies have websites, you can't open an account online processing times are very, very long. And then the terms and pricing for small businesses is also very complex and convoluted. And so here we are. We are the first company providing online invoice factoring, completely 100% online. You can go to our website. You can open an account within five minutes. You can connect your accounting software and you can get funded with a click of a button. That is certainly a departure from how these services operate until now. Yesterday we launched our new product, uh, a line of credit offering, in addition to our online factoring product. This is to complement our, and create a broader base of products such that we can offer the right product to the small business owner that fits their need. With both products, we're taking the same approach, very streamlined, online, click a button and get funded experience. We are a technology company that does financing, not a financing company that kind of dabbles in technology, okay? What that means is, 50% of our company today is R&D and data science. We start off with a lot of data, okay? We are integrated over 20 APIs. We aggregate data over the web. We collect a lot of information, which we gather, we cleanse, we enrich, and then we use very complicated machine learning algorithms 
to enable very quick underwriting and very quick operations. We operate completely different under the hood than traditional financing companies work. We are really leveraging technology. Technology. At the end of the day, you know, the small business owner, he doesn't care about that, but what it translates into is a very slick product and user experience and a very high level of service. One that is completely different in the offline model. Small businesses love our service. This is a very strong statement. They love our service. There's not a lot of providers that can say that their clients, especially in financing, really love them. And we have over 300 reviews online. You can go on and read them. And this is what we're trying to do. We are creating a better user experience in financing and making the lives of small business owners easier. Thank you. Thanks, thanks very much, Yael. And now we'll, we'll proceed with, with Tim. So if you want to talk a little bit about Avant, please. Sure. Thank you, Oscar. And good morning, everyone. Uh, like Yael, this is my first time in Japan. Uh, it's a beautiful country, and thank you for having me. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about our business and, and then uh, looking forward to the panel. So uh, Avant, uh, which was founded uh, three years ago, or a little bit over three years ago, uh, was founded with a, a pretty simple mission statement, which was to lower the costs and barriers of borrowing. Um, and, and we're looking to do that globally, and we're focusing specifically on the middle class, which, as James mentioned, is, uh, is a population that, uh, that has been left behind by, uh, by some of the banking industry. So our market is uh, is focused on consumer credit um, as a, as opposed to the the um, the business focus uh, the small business focus of, of Blue Vine. Uh, we we think consumer credit is a massive market opportunity. If you look across personal loans, credit cards, auto loans, student and mortgage, uh, it's a twelve trillion dollar market in the U.S. alone. And, uh, and we're focused today on those first three products, personal, card, and auto, uh, but ultimately plan to be a, a, a credit provider um, across all of these uh, to middle class consumers in the US and globally. So a, a little snapshot of, um, of the, the lending industry in the US and, and, and where Avant and some of the other online lenders fit in. So specifically, what we're trying to do is bring uh, best-in-class technology and um, you know, a really strong customer experience to middle-class or near-prime credit consumers. So we think uh, near-prime you know, and middle-class folks really were left behind by banks after the financial crisis in 2008 and 2009. It's very difficult, as, uh, as James said, for them to access credit today, uh, even for simple things like medical expenses, moving, uh, other kind of life events that, that occur. And what we want to do is, is provide that credit to them in a really efficient manner. And, and we, we've utilized technology to do so cheaper and, and more efficiently, while also delivering a really strong experience to the customer. A little bit about Avant and, and who, who we are today, you know, three, three and a half years or, or just under three and a half years after we were founded in 2000, 2012, we, we've grown uh, to be a, a 900 person company. Most of, most of those folks are in Chicago in the United States, but we also have offer offices in, in Los Angeles and London. We've issued uh, three billion, over $3 billion of loans uh, to uh, our customers over the course of those, those three years. Um, and, and we've raised, in order to issue those loans, over $3 billion in funding. Uh, that makes us the fastest growing company in Chicago ever. Uh, so knock on wood that we can keep that pace up, but it's been really exciting 
to be a part of, uh, of something like that um, with, uh, with such an entrepreneurial, strong growth story. Today, as I mentioned, we're providing uh, unsecured personal loans to consumers. We've also launched an auto loan product and plan later this year to launch a credit card product. Uh, we're doing 90% of our business today in the US, uh, but about 10% of our business is outside of the US, both in the United Kingdom as well as Canada. The plan ultimately is to expand across the globe and, and provide a similar on, high quality online experience to these middle class consumers globally. A little bit about our, our product and our customer uh, very quickly. On, a, on an average basis, our consumer makes about 55 or $60,000 US dollars of annual income. So it's a true um, you know, middle, middle class consumer, uh, our, our range, whether you look at um, a, a credit metric like FICO or, or uh, an income metric, accounts for about 40 or 50% of the population and we believe the, the part of the population that's most underserved. Uh, we are, on average, writing them uh, $8,000 loans, although the loans can range in size from $1,000 to $35,000. Uh, we've, um, we've got interest rates, or a APRs, that range between 9 and 36%, uh, with the average today being about 29 or 30. And these loans will be um, two to five years in, in term, with the average loan duration being about four years. One other thing that I'll, I'll note on this slide, uh, I mentioned before, we've written over $3 billion of loans, but um, in our view, more importantly, is we've, we've served over 400,000 customers, and, and actually that number's a bit dated. It's now over 5, 500,000 customers. So we're, um, we're really excited to be uh, bringing this product to uh, folks in the United States and globally, and we think there's really high demand for it, especially in a customer-friendly way online. And, and to wrap up, I'll just talk high level about a couple of things that differentiate us from some of the other online lenders in the space, uh, and, and some of these things are really similar to what uh, my two co-panelists are, are doing uh, with their businesses. But, but first, I'll, I'll talk about funding. Um, we've, we embrace uh, the fact that a, as a lender, uh, we need to have a balance sheet. So we, you know, some of our competitors um, sell 100% of the loans they originate. We believe that that, that can cause uh, problems with alignments of incentives. So we think it's really important um, as a, a strategic uh, you know, growth initiative to have a balance sheet. And we fund about 50% of our loans today with capital that we've raised. We've raised over $650 million of equity capital in five private rounds. The other 50% uh, of our loans uh, we sell to uh, best-in-class third-party investors. Um, names like KKR, uh, for instance, was the first uh, whole loan sale partner that we had. And then lastly, we're also raising uh, you know, captive fund vehicles. Um, it's a product we're calling Avant Capital Advisors, and it's a way to provide yield to uh, you know, in individual investors th through a fund and family offices, pension funds, et cetera, through a fund. And, and we think it offers really attractive returns and, and gives kind of access to, uh, to a new asset class um, for those folks. It, it, aside from funding, we're using really uh, cutting edge technology. I would encourage all of you to go to our website and, uh, and uh, apply for a loan. It, it takes, uh, takes about five minutes. It's a really customer-friendly experience. And on the back end, uh, we're able to run an advanced machine learning algorithm that evaluates the creditworthiness of that borrower and give them a decision about 15 or 20 seconds after they filled out an, that five-minute application on whether or not we can extend credit. Uh, that real-time decision making and, and, our, and our ability to fund customers next day has really led to uh, you know, 
very high customer satisfaction scores and helped us uh, bring in a lot of customers to the Avant platform. We do 100% of the loan servicing uh, for the loans that we write in-house, uh, which we think, again, is really important. Uh, every time one of our customers uh, hops on the phone it, you know, to call customer service, they're speaking to an Avant employee. And, uh, and we take, take that customer satisfaction really seriously because we, we want to we wanna build the you know, customer lifetime value and, and, uh, and hold on to you know, build brand loyalty over time. A couple other things we're doing um, on the marketing side, we're, we're similarly using advanced machine learning algorithms to determine who the best customers are to market to. Um, and, and then lastly, you know, we've built, a, we've got a, a really extensive compliance organization with it, within Avant because we want to make sure that we really understand, um, particularly as we enter new markets, the regulatory regime and we're doing everything, everything the right way to keep uh, both customers and regulators happy. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank, thanks very much, Tim. Thank you. So um, we have a, a lot of very interesting topics to, to, to cover about precisely how disruptive this industry is and, and how it's actually changing the traditional banking industry. So just wanted to uh, show um, a few slides very, very briefly, um, kind of um, trying to, to grasp the, the magnitude of, of what's happening in this industry, uh, which is not just in, in the US, but also in, in other countries, like very rapidly spreading to, to places like the UK, Australia, and also China, which is a huge market. So here we see how in, in the UK, since 2010, there's been about 1.8 billion of, of loans generated. Um, in, in America, we see how loan uh, or P2P lending origination actually went from less than, than a billion in, in 2006 to over five and a half billion in 2014, and uh, that trend keeps growing. The industry is professionalizing as well. So P2P is actually a bit of a misnomer in the sense that the first peer in the peer-to-peer -peer world is no longer uh, an individual or an investor, but actually institutional in investors that are giving them the money to, to the industry. And that's actually one of the challenges that, that we're, gonna, we're gonna discuss. We also see how small business lending uh, for, for U.S. banks has, has gone down. It used to be 58%, and now it's, it's gone down to 43%, and then that gap's actually being filled by this industry, which is not only disruptive, but it's also filling a very important need. Um, also, the loans originated by large U U.S. banks have gone down by about 40% over the last few years, from 72 down to about 50 billion. And finally, we get to see how in China also the P2P industry has absolutely blossomed. There's about 2,000 P2P lending platforms in China. But before we, we get to this point, we'd like to actually cover how did it all begin. Um, obviously, you know, we have like companies that are very developed such as, such as Avant and, and companies that are still growing, uh, such as Insect or, or Bluevine. So perhaps um, as entrepreneurs, uh, you guys could address the, the growing pains that, that, that you went and how the, the first loans were, were generated. Um, James? Th thank you. Uh, well, first, just to see a show of hands, how many people want to be an entrepreneur, start a company one day? Um, okay, well, so my, my story is uh, uh, when I started Inseekt, um, I was fortunate that I had a little bit of a track record in lending. Uh, my prior company uh, had made over a million, had lent to over a million people uh, and had a very successful track record in credit. So, uh, and, and some stories, when I started that company, I just, to give you a sense, the, we raised $1 million in our very first round and we had one very well-known uh, hedge fund investor put in most of that money and he said to me, you know, I'm not sure if lending to the uh, people who are working in the kitchen and people who are helping me with my uh, landscaping of my house on the weekends are going to be good borrowers, but I'm going to invest one million and you have one rule and you have to lend it out, but you have to get it back and people have to pay back. 
So that, that rule always stuck that we had to be very good at credit underwriting. Credit quality is the most important. And so uh, in InSeq, when we started, we were fortunate because a lot of our old uh, lenders and investors had believed in us again that the next revolution was going to be brands, not banks, uh, lending to tomorrow, uh, to uh, becoming the lenders of tomorrow. And so as we, as we started to build out um, InSeq, our first partner uh, was a company that I had met in my prior life. And they came to us, and we, we had just built the technology that you saw with the tablets and being able to apply in a store. And we hadn't tested it on anyone. So I think for me, maybe the founder story is more how we got our first partner. And uh, this, this CEO of a company, they had 20 stores in California, and they said, you know, uh, we really need to give our customers uh, a loan product and a very affordable loan product, and we want to be the first one to take that risk. Um, and they said, but listen, uh, you know, this needs to go well because um, we're, we're believing in you. And so in the first 30 days, we, we or not the first 30 days, in the first 10 days, we had uh, 60 applications come through, and we declined every single one of them. So the first 60 people to apply, they all got declined. And uh, of course, you know, he called us up and he said, I don't think this is going so well. You're not, no one's getting approved, and it's not a good customer experience. And I think, obviously, we overcame that. Now they're one of our best partners. They're very happy. We've grown into all of their 20 stores. But that gives you an idea of what it's like being an entrepreneur. Every day, you get the bad news. And then all you do is you go back and you keep iterating and evolving and trying to figure out how you, how you make it better. So thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, yeah, do you want to talk about um, your experience, any make or break moments you might have had? There's a lot of them. <laughs> um, I'll talk about two things. Um, one was uh, when we started, um, we had um, we were very optimistic and and bright eyed, and uh, you know we thought, well, if we build it, they will come. And we basically launched our our website and our product um, two and a half years ago, and crickets, nobody's coming, right? Uh, it's not enough to build it. You need to market it. And uh, as you heard from my presentation, there's a thousand factoring out there. So it, it's not that you know when we put up our sign that we're open, people will be knocking down the door. And um, it took us, I think, a week from the time that we opened to our first applicant. Uh, but even then, in the first couple of months, it was basically one, you know, one funding or one loan a day or some th days nothing was coming. Uh, we're basically our analysts were like waiting for, for loans to come in the door. Uh, today we're processing thousands per day, but I remember in the beginning um, it takes time. So uh, if you are starting a company in this space, especially if you're directly targeting businesses or consumers, uh, it's not you know, if I make it, they will come. You need to market. And uh, what Tim, what you mentioned around um, uh, using um, sophisticated marketing uh, techniques to target the right customers, I think it's certainly right. In our business, customer acquisition is one of the greatest challenges. And so um, it's not only about making the right product or, uh, you know, amazing technology. Is being to, you need to be a very good marketer. Um, so that's, that's the first story. The second one is, in our, in our line of business, uh, you need to be very precise. Um, bugs, technology bugs, uh, can create very unpleasant situations. Uh, you're not dealing with software that if you send it to a client and something doesn't work, then they tell you there's a bug and then you fix it. We had a case once where we had this loop in our system where we funded um, a loan for $20,000 and our system kept going on a loop. And instead of sending them $20,000, we sent them a million dollars, okay? A million dollars. And suddenly, my back office team calls me, uh-oh, made a mistake, sent too much money. Fortunately, this was a very honest client and he called in and he said, uh, you know, 
I really love your service. I asked for 20,000 and you give me a million. This is amazing. Um, but he, he let us take it back and, uh, and we dealt with this and, and it was fine. But it's, it's one of those moments when at the time we were um, relatively new and we hadn't raised a lot of money yet. And you can imagine what would have happened if we've lost a million dollars in a day due to a technical error. So um, in our line of business, it's not, it's not for the faint of heart. Things happen. Um, there are glitches that happen. We deal with regulations. Um, I can tell you there's been several times where you know, my heart skipped a couple of beats due to things that are happening. And so, um, but you deal with it. Excellent. And I, I think, Tim, you know, also about um, how Avant was, was built. And I think, you know, contrary to, I guess, what uh, Bluevine or Instinct have done, you guys kind of, you know, started like making the loans and then kind of like progressively built the technology. Do you want to sort of like talk about? Yeah, that, 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 that's exactly right, Oscar. And, and um, it, you know, full, full disclosure, I, I was not in the room uh, when, when the business was started. I joined about a year and a half later to help build out our funding efforts. But our three co-founders, a um, gentleman named Al Goldstein, uh, John Sun, and Paul Zhang, uh, had a very similar story to James, where uh, the prior business venture was um, was a lending business. So they they had done it uh, once before and actually had successfully done it online. So when the trend that Oscar mentioned occurred, where P2P really became you know more institutional funding um, to uh, to persons uh, borrowing, uh, Al. John and Paul uh, got together with a venture capitalist in in, uh, in California and on the back of a napkin sort of drew up the idea for Avant and, and we were going to be kind of from the beginning uh, funded institutionally. Now, uh, this was in late 2012. At, at, on the very last day, though, of 2012 on, on New Year's Eve uh, was when we, we wrote the first loans at Avant, um, and these were uh, manually underwritten. This was before we had developed the machine learning algorithm we utilize today. So Al uh, and, and John and Paul uh, um, and a few other early employees wrote some loans, picked the customers to lend to, popped a bottle of champagne, and, and hoped that they didn't default. Uh, you know, three plus years later, uh, after having issued uh, you know, three billion dollars of loans, and and um, you know, building the business that we built, kind of going from a, a million dollars of initial seed funding to, you know, we've raised raised over six hundred today, and and our latest valuation, um, you know, is is, uh, is was two billion dollars. Uh, clearly, it, clearly, it's been a success. Wonderful. So, um, as we know from the statistics. P2P lending has accounted for about 10% of all loans generated in, in the US last year. What makes the models so attractive? Is it the, the pricing? Is it the access? Is it the technology? Could you guys comment a little bit on, on what, what do you think makes you so strong and, and why are you being so disruptive? Anyone? I'll take it. Um, so I'll, I'll refer to small businesses, but I think it's probably similar in consumers to some extent. Um, in, in the small business market, um, small businesses usually optimize on one dimension, mostly, either speed and ease and simplicity or cost. Um, there's not a lot of times when people do the weighted average of the combined. They say, well, I want a little bit fast and and slightly less expensive, and so this is what I'll find. It's mostly, I want it as fast as I can. Obviously not you know, insanely expensive, but as fast as I can, as easy as I can get it, no strings, no hoops, or I want to find uh, something which is a lower cost product, and then um, I'll take my time, and I'll look through options, and I'll try to find somewhere which is, which is obviously a good product, but I'm really looking for a lower cost. We are certainly in the camp of the fast, um, the fast, simple, transparent, for that, you really need technology. That is how we're materially different than a bank, where a bank is always going to be less expensive than us. Their cost of capital is basically zero because of consumer deposits. So we're not going to be the low-cost provider. But what we can do with 
technology as an enabler with data, with machine learning algorithms, is provide a very simple, a very fast, um, an instant type of gratification experience where somebody basically presses a button and then magic. They get approved and then money is in their account within a few hours. That is why they're willing to pay a little bit more for the speed. In our world, many times, small business owners, when they come to us, they needed the money yesterday, not now, yesterday, because they need to make payroll. And if they don't have the money, employees are not going to be tolerant to not getting paid on time. Or if they need to buy inventory because there's a standing purchase order. So we're certainly in the camp of speed, and technology is a big factor there. Just to add a few points, so uh, first let's talk about, well, the consumer marketplace lending. So the first thing that happened is banks stopped lending and lending to as many people. So there is a big gap and a lot of companies have stepped in to disrupt that. So that's the first thing is there was less funding from banks. Second, there was a shift from consumers to go from revolving credit to installment. Uh, in the US, most of unsecured credit has been on credit cards, revolving credit cards. It's, it, was, it was banks don't really offer anymore, here's a $5,000, $10,000, $20,000 personal loan with fixed payments every month on an amortizing basis. And so, you know, Prosper, Lending Club were some of the first companies to introduce that product on a, more, on a wider basis. And I think that's after the crisis, consumers kind of felt, you know, I want to be more responsible with managing credit. I can budget for a fixed payment. And so I think there was a a shift to go for in installment. On the technology side, two things happen. One is uh, there's less friction applying online. You can get a, fair, a very fast, because of all the data that, you know, building APIs, you can pull data from, from one electronic source for, to another electronic source to credit bureaus. You can have 2,000 variables and you can analyze someone very quickly in real time. Now, it still takes what most people don't know is it still takes four, five, six days to actually get a loan from Lending Club. Uh, you, might be apply, you might be approved very quickly online, but they still do an income verification. You still have to submit documents, and you still go through a process. So the initial part feels like less friction. And, and certainly, if you walk into a bank branch uh, these days, maybe it takes 60 days to get the loan. So it's still faster. Um, but, you know, it, it, uh, taking out some of that friction online was important. Uh, this, the fourth item is, is payments. The fact that people feel more comfortable making payments through electronic means in the U.S. ACH. So I can apply for a loan online and I can click, I'm going to repay that loan from my bank account through ACH, I think has also shifted a lot of the lending to be an online. Now, having said all that, what percent... Uh, what, what's the number one acquisition channel for online lending today in the U.S.? It's still the old-fashioned credit card model of direct mail. Direct mail is probably 50, 60 percent of how all these online lenders get their customers. They send mail, you get the mailer, you look at it, then you go online and apply. So, you know, it's a combination of using old tactics that have worked for many years and also taking friction using technology. Um, it's not entirely online, but it's a, it's a more efficient process. I will say one other thing. I think the true innovation in P2P lending in the U.S. has been more on how they fund the loans than necessarily how they get borrowers. I think, and Lending Club and Prosper were really the first to try and democratize, hey, we're making all these loans. How can we get the little person, peer-to-peer -peer lending, who can put in $20 to be able to fund into this loan and still make that compliant with the SEC. I think that's where there was a lot of innovation. I think today, Lending Club has 40, maybe 50% of all of the capital that comes into Lending Club comes from uh, very small individual investors. Um, that crowdfunding is, I think, where technology has really helped the lending industry, because you don't need to have deposits to, to be able to lend uh, as a traditional bank. Excellent, thank you. So jumping to an, another topic, um, obviously in industries such as e-commerce or the sharing economy, we see a lot of disruption coming from the startups by effectively not always obeying the rules or, or trying to, to change the rules. 
Now, obviously, if you, if you do that in, in the finance industry, which is very, very heavily regulated, you can end up in jail. So can you, can you guys talk a little bit about the regulatory challenges that you're seeing and, and you know, perhaps, you know, particularly Avant, as, as you guys have moved in, into the UK and are expanding international and maybe also EL, um, can, can you talk about like, the, the legal challenges that you're seeing to, to your businesses? Tim? Sure. Um, I think from a regulatory perspective, you know, this is still a regu you know, relatively young industry. And so anytime there's a young industry, and particularly one that's very, you know, we, we've lent to 500,000 customers in the US, uh, that's going to begin to get regulators' attention. Um, so there's always a risk that, you know, regulation um, comes in and, and sort of limits what you can do. Now at Avant, uh, we take regulation extremely seriously. We've built up a team of 50 people internally who are focused on nothing but re uh, regulatory, including 11 in-house lawyers. So we kind of joke that we have a little middle market law firm uh, within the company. But um, we're, we're very focused on it. And, uh, and actually, uh, recently, we, we brought on um, to our board uh, Sheila Bear, who was the former chairwoman of the FDIC uh, in the financial crisis in the United States. So uh, we're very focused on reaching out to the regulatory community, making sure that we're doing things um, in a way that they think is, is fair to customers. And, and ultimately, we believe that if we're delivering a great product that customers love, and anytime there are um, complaints, we manage them, uh, you know, we, we take it very seriously and, and manage them, That that. Ultimately, the, re the regulators are going to be happy um, with what we're providing because it's providing utility to consumers. Similarly, as we try to expand globally, you know, every regulatory environment is a little bit different. So uh, what we like to do uh, as we expand into new markets is build a team to focus on it, fi find people who are boots in the ground, on the ground in the lo local jurisdiction, and start our product slowly, make sure we understand everything, you know, and, and communicate properly with the regulators. And, and once we feel comfortable that we, we understand every, you know, the regulatory elements of, of that particular jurisdiction and how they compare to, to the U.S. jurisdiction where we're, where we're a little bit more familiar, that, that's when we begin, begin to scale our product. So we think regulatory, um, you know, eventually is going to be necessary, uh, and, and we're only going to see more of it in, in our industry. And we want to be kind of on the leading edge of making sure we're doing everything um, to align our incentives properly with customers, regulators, and, and really all stakeholders involved. Thanks, and I think you know, Insect has been particularly in, in, in terms of like trying to keep the regulators happy, as Tim was saying, or trying to influence the, the regs. To make them, um, to uh, I guess empower the, the borrowers. Um, James, can can you comment a little bit about what you guys are doing? Sure. In the U.S., you have I think three buckets of regulation. So the first is protecting consumers. So uh, there's a big feeling in the U.S. that you know we have to make sure the disclosures. So you see, you get a loan product, you know the APR. Uh, we have to make sure that we're lending to all communities. You know, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, there was a lending that wouldn't happen in some communities that were poor and only happened in wealthy communities. And so there's a lot of regulation around that. Um, and that's now governed by the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Uh, they're actually coming out with new rules in the US regarding small loans. So that's gonna be a landmark uh, new rules that will be coming out. And the fundamental premise that they're focused on is what they've done in the mortgage industry is similar. If you make a loan to someone, you have to verify that they can repay that loan. So did you test their ability to repay? And you think this is kind of, you know, it kind of makes sense. You wanna make sure responsible lending is that I verified someone's income, verify they can repay. That's the big uh, shift that's coming soon. The second is protecting the economy. If you're a bank, regulators care about the safety and soundness of your bank. What are your capital requirements? How much risk are you taking? So we don't have this problem of banks failing and then the government and taxpayers have to bail them out. So if you use FDIC insurance and you insure your depositors, then the government is effectively on the hook 
And so they're very much looking into the kind of risk you take. Now, the issue with marketplace lending is that there's no, they're not banks. So they're, ta they're lending, but they're not taking um, the actual, uh, they're not taking the risk of depositors to fund those loans. They're creating this crowdfunding market or selling whole loans or keeping some on balance sheet, but they're not regulated in terms of the bank the way a bank would. So I think this is the open question. Uh, I think that Tim, Tim was referencing is that we're still young and the industry, I think uh, the Treasury Department and others are trying to figure out because in the mortgage industry, they establish 5% risk retention. That means that if I lend, I have to keep 5% of the risk of every loan on my balance sheet. So the question is, should that be the same for a Prosper or a lending club who have historically just sold all the loans. The last thing I'll mention is, uh, as, as Oscar was saying, what most people don't realize is interest rates in the US are set at the state level, not at the federal level. So the federal doesn't state uh, uh, express interest rate regulation. It's California, it's Texas, it's New York, they all do it separately. Just to give you an idea, New York, it's criminal to make a loan you can be criminally prosecuted if it's above 25%. So some states are all over the map. Uh, and what a lot of companies have done is they partnered with banks like WebBank and others that allow them to export rates from one state and not have to, uh, and, and sort of preempt state law. So that's another area that's getting looked at uh, and whether that sustains. What we've done, what Oscar was mentioning, is where we were in California for many years helping low-income people get access to credit, and the law didn't really work for us, so we actually passed three laws in California to change the law. Uh, and we changed the law in a way that we said will help people get, get credit, and we're actually introducing uh, legislation in New York and Florida to do the same. Excellent, thanks, which also leads to the question of sustainability. As you guys are, are, are growing bigger, um, we actually see some of the more established banks. I mean, obviously, all the banks are, are giving you lines of, of, of credit, so you guys can on lend that money. We have seen JP Morgan, for instance, investing in OnDeck. At the same time, some of the publicly traded companies, such as Lending Club, have actually faced a, a very poor stock performance and have you know, collapsed about like 50% from the moment um, they went public. Um, can you guys very quickly mention whether you, you will see some consolidation happening and actually whether, you know, playing devil's advocate, whether you think the models are sustainable given the scale that's necessary and how capital consuming lending is. Well, I mean, I think our industry to some extent, um, there are similar characteristics to the banking industry. Uh, if you look in banking in most geographies, um, there's probably you know, a couple large banks, which uh, carry most of the consumer deposits, and then a trail of smaller ones. There is, um, there is significant advantage of the scale in our, in our industry, uh, whether it's in sales and marketing or infrastructure. Um, you know, in banking, it's branches and ATMs, but there are even infrastructure advantages in our world, whether it's regulatory or others. And so I think our industry is to some extent similar. I think what you will see is, um, in some cases, uh, companies like Avant doing more and more products and kind of diversifying their portfolio. Again, similar to banks. Once you acquire um, a consumer or a small business, you want to be able to provide them with an option of what they need. And then throughout their life cycle, as they need more and more things, you're able to do that. You're able to cross-sell. You're able to upsell. It's all about the acquisition and the life and the lifetime. And so um, when talking about consolidation, I think because of these trends, I think some of it will happen. I think you will see some companies, fintech companies, becoming very large ones um, and becoming multi-product ones and becoming global ones. And then I think some of them will acquire smaller ones or you know, CIT acquired direct capital um, when they, you know, they wanted to add that capability to their portfolio. So I do, see, I do see both of that happening. Some of the fintech players will become very large companies. But I think there's quite a bit of, of fintech players today, and I don't think all of them will survive. I think there will be some consolidation. Excellent, thanks. So um, now I would like to open it to, to the audience for, for some questions. So if we can get a, a show of hands of anybody that um, wants to address our panelists. Can we get a, a mic for that gentleman, please? Hi. 
Thank you very much. You. I'm a small company's owner. I have a question. Uh, basically, a uh, bank, uh, before lending money, uh, they visit the company or factory, and uh, they can check uh, the individual uh, technology or asset or value. But I think uh, FinTech, uh, on the website, uh, you cannot, I think, uh, you cannot uh, check uh, invisible asset or invisible value. Uh, how do you think uh, this issue? Uh, please uh, give me uh, your suggestion, please. So um, you're right. You know, banks do a lot more to vet um, business owners, and that's exactly why they don't lend as much. You know, you see what's going on in the U.S. Um, because of the amount of effort they spend on vetting uh, applicants, and they do the same whether it's a $50,000 loan or a million dollar loan, it's a problem for them to do very small loans because it's not cost effective for them. Now, there's two things that allow us to operate differently. One, we have a lot of other, a lot of other substitute data that we use in lieu of the tests that they do, okay? Um, so some of that data is traditional sources of data, whether it's credit data um, or financial statements, uh, but some of it is more, I would say, um, non-traditional, whether it's web sentiment or other sources. And so that's number one. We're able to complement the underwriting that we do from traditional sources, from non-traditional sources, that provide an indication. Just to give you an example, um, you can see whether a business gets good reviews online. It tells you whether they do their job properly, if they're a good business or not, right? A bank doesn't look at that, and that is valuable information. So, you know, that's number one. And then the other part of it is that we do lend at a higher rate. We do have a higher tolerance for defaults. Banks, because of regulations in the U.S., they lend at different rates, and so that doesn't afford them the opportunity. They can't have any losses where we can't have huge losses as well, but we're able to have controlled losses, and that allows us to take some more risk. Excellent, thanks. We have uh, qu time for one or two more, more questions. And any, anybody else, please? Please go ahead. And can, we, can we get a, a mic here at, at the front, please? Uh, yes, could you comment on maybe the increased competition for credit quality? And as a result, the increased competition for liquidity as well. I mean, you originate most of your loans. Uh, Lending Club sells them immediately. I wanted to have your opinion on that. And also, maybe the average rate of default on the loans that you originate. Thank you. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll start and then others uh, feel free to fill in. But um, from a, a credit quality standpoint and, and competition, um, you know, we sit in a, a little bit of a unique part of the market. I think um, banks aren't really lending to our consumer, and we also don't overlap a ton with where uh, Lending Club and Prosper and some of these other businesses do. Um, there are some a few uh, really prominent storefront businesses in the U.S. that target uh, a similar consumer to us. They're uh, called Springleaf and, and One Main Financial. Um, and I think what we try to do to you know compete with those businesses is is deliver a superior customer experience. Um, and, and I think you know you've seen sort of a one one way migration to online across lots of other industries, and you're starting to see this in lending and in fintech, um, you know, in in recent years. And then I think from a liquidity perspective, you know, we think it's really important to diversify our sources of funding. And we've we've been fortunate enough um, to to make over 500,000 loans, build a really complex, effective algorithm to underwrite credit. And what we've seen is that as you know, every quarter we grow our monthly originations exponentially. Our credit performance on our loans, the default rate, has also improved dramatically. And, and because of that. And because we also align our incentives you know, properly with investors by holding risk on our own balance sheet, we, we've seen, you know, we've had an ability to raise uh, quite a bit of capital even, you know, in choppier markets uh, where some, some of our peers ha have not had quite as much luck. 
So um, the risk you are identifying is 100% the risk of a non-bank lender. Uh, it's every, everything's great until all of a sudden there's no more capital and there's no more liquidity. Um, the days of, uh, I think, this revolution of fintech lenders getting rewarded for just growth and growth only is, I think, about to end. It's going to really shift to quality and not just let me see month one of performance of the loans you did last month, but I want to see month 60 of the loans you did 60 months ago. And I want to see the full seasoning of that vintage and see did it actually hit the level you said. And so I think what's going to happen is we're going to see a bit of a shakeout this year where the capital that was coming in, a lot of it's going to come down and it's going to be a flight to quality. And it's going to take a while for people to figure out which platforms actually have seasoned performance that's successful. Um, and I think that is going to actually be good for the industry because you're going to, you know, the, the bottom line is the macro trend is there. The banks are not lending, you know, as Tim said, and, and so there's a big market gap. It's just going to take time to cycle through to see you know, it's not just having 10 Stanford PhDs doing, you know, machine learning, you know, credit scoring. It's, it's really, you know, do your losses perform over time and also through cycles. And we haven't seen a cycle because the other thing to note is all the lending that's happened in the last three years has been in the best credit environment ever, the lowest unemployment rate ever uh, in the la you know, in a long time. And so we haven't seen the severity of losses when you get a, a shock to the system. And so I think, you know, it's a good thing. Uh, and I think that the best companies will survive. But I think, as Tim said, it's all about how we diversify our funding sources so that you're doing some whole loan sales here, uh, you're doing securitization, that's what we do, and, and, and running that. Um, but also, you're willing to show investors that you hold some on balance sheet. And I think you're going to start seeing a lot of the non-balance sheet lenders become balance sheet lenders as a result. Excellent. So we're running out of time, so unfortunately we have to wrap up. So if you guys could, each one of you, make one brief statement, very brief, about you know, your future outlook of the industry. Tim? Yeah, sure. I, thanks, Oscar. I, I think, um, you know, thank you to, to all of you for, for having me here. I think um, a lot of the trends for the future in the industry have been covered here, and I think you know, I'll just kind of echo uh, what, what James was just mentioning. You've seen you know, whether it be in the United States or, as, as Oscar was pointing out, in, in China and, and all, all over the world, there's a, a lot of platforms that have been uh, chasing this idea because it's an exciting idea that has great macro trends behind it and, uh, and also can deliver a, a, you know, a great product to customers. But I think there's going to be key platforms that do a good job of differentiating their product offering, you know, are customer friendly and align their incentives properly with others uh, in the industry, and those, you know, like like the three up here, are, are going to be, you know, the long-term survivors, and and you know what really makes this ind industry continue to grow. James, sure, lending is a service. So because banks are not able to make these loans, uh, what we think is going to be the big trend is brands, because you're sitting on all kinds of data, being able to lend to their customers. Uh, and I, you know, my hope is that InSeq is going to really be part of that revolution and making that happen. We hope starting, you know, in the U.S., but you know, also globally, and seeing how we can uh, be part of that revolution. You're, you're part of it already. <laughs> yeah. So I, I agree. There's going to be a little bit of a, of a choppy environment going forward, but you know, at the same time, I'm extremely optimistic about this industry. One one thing that we need to remember, right? You know, even though uh, fintech is getting a lot of press. Uh, relatively, especially in financing, it's it's a drop in the bucket, right? I mean, J.P. Morgan, I think, lent out to small businesses in my in my world, 60 billion last year. Okay, so all the online lenders are a couple of points compared to the traditional financing world still, and because of secular trends, because of of, of everything that's happening. I think there is a lot of room to grow and consumers and small business owners are starting to go to online financing as a form of choice and not as a backup. And it's starting to happen more and more. So I'm super excited to be part of that. Excellent. Well, thanks everybody. And a special thanks to our hosts. And uh, I guess we'll wrap it up. Thank you very much. <laughs>